it's really not about the technology tool. Like there isn't a magic tool that you'll give to your kids and all of a sudden they'll know, you know, their note names or they'll understand, um, you know, key signatures, but it's finding um, a technology tool and then using it with other instructional means then to, uh, to boost your students' achievement. Um, well, welcome to season two of Masters of the Musiverse. I'm really excited for this upcoming season because I learned a lot during season one. Um, things like how to schedule interviews. <laughs> and this summer I've been scheduling interviews and I'm making all kinds of plans that I'm just terribly excited for. I've also got some new gadgets that are going to help me um, you know, be more efficient in my like video editing um, and just have better interviews. Things like this cool broadcasting tool that enable me to, uh, you know, cut to images or things like this score from composer Paul Craven. So really, really excited for that, for things like that. I, you know, I like tech things. So, um, so I think that there are going to be a lot of um, exciting announcements that come this season, but I kind of have to keep a lid on things until all the pieces fall into place. But I'd really appreciate if you just followed um, me on social media, follow Masters of the Museverse on whatever social media you use so that you can be up to date on those announcements. Um, and also, I want to bring more people to the table. I want to hear more stories, get more great teaching examples and, and tools to use. So, uh, you know, f contribute, comment on social media on these, on these, these videos um, so that, uh, you know, we can all share in this. So let's move on to this interview. Keith Osvath, is a great educator. He's really on the forefront of uh, technology in our music rooms. And uh, in this video, we cover a lot of different things. Um, I fast track this because uh, Keith has got a really exciting program coming up that I, I think you'll want to be a part of. So starting August 3rd, Keith will be part of a program called Rebuild, Recruit, Cultivate, and Motivate, gearing up for a new year and getting students back in the game. It's part of uh, Vandercook College of Music. And so uh, the link is in the registration below. Do yourself a favor and after watching this video, check out the program. You'll be so excited to see the great educators that we'll, we'll be presenting. So let, let's get to that interview now. Welcome to Masters of the Musiverse. Today I'm excited to speak with Keith, Os Keith Osvath from Rotola. You know, I thought of all the, the parts of your name I was going to mess up. It wouldn't be Keith. Keith Osvath from Rotola Middle School in Batavia, Illinois. Thanks for being here today, Keith. Yeah, I'm excited to be here as well. So thanks for asking me. Yeah. So everyone, please take a moment, subscribe to the podcast and YouTube channel, like this video and click the bell to be notified when uh, there's going to be new guests like Keith. So Keith and I haven't met before, um, but after interviewing Pete Sampson of Whiteland, Indiana in season one, I asked him, who should I talk to? And he said, you got to talk to Keith. He's a great middle school band director. So I did a little bit of research and Keith, you certainly have uh, some awesome credentials, including the Chicagoland Outstanding Music Educator Award, twice who's who, amongst America, uh, who's who among America's teachers and the Exemplary Educator Award from the Batavia Condo Parent Organization. So let's uh, let's get into thing. You teach at uh, Rotolo and Batavia, and a little side note: my first job was right next door in Aurora, Illinois. Oh, really? Yeah, way back in two thousand three. So nice. Um, so Rotolo Middle School is grades six through eight with an enrollment about thirteen hundred. Did I get that right? Yes. Um, I'm curious what music offerings you have for students in Rotolo. Like, what's the whole package that you guys offer? Yeah, so uh, we actually have everything. We have band, orchestra, chorus. Um, we have over half the students uh, are enrolled in one of those ensembles, um, and they're available to you know all the students sixth through eighth grade. Um, so it's it's a really strong program, and uh, we all the co all my colleagues work really well together, and we also team teach together. So uh, almost every class has has two teachers available and we're used in different capacities. I noticed in your credentials, you were in the Nazareth Academy High School Fine Arts Hall of Fame. So is that where you went to school? Yeah, yeah, that's in uh, LaGrange Park. It's a suburb of Chicago. So they started something new where they're trying to honor alumni. And uh, I was just fortunate enough to, to be in their Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, what special experiences then did you have at Nazareth that 
started enticing you in music? You know, I really think it was um, just the, the friendships and uh, we, our director was, you know, he had high expectations. So we had just great experiences. We, we were a small band, but we played well um, for our, our resources that were available. And it was, it was everything. It was bus rides. It was concerts. It was the, the contests we went to in marching band, in concert band. It was the summer camps we, we went to. Um, and I, it, it was kind of everything that just gave, just was very influential on me um, and really just gave me some positive experiences in music that I loved it so much that I, you know, wanted to continue it in, in, into college. So I'm guessing that you've pulled that stuff into what you do now, like not just the music stuff, but making sure there's, there's social aspects of what you're doing in the classroom and engaging in that way with students. Yeah, my, you know, in, in college, we had to write, you know, what's our philosophy of music education. And, you know, I, I still remember my, my opening uh, sentence was giving students positive experiences in music or through music. And I really, I really think, think, think that, that holds true to me uh, and my teaching right now. You know, I, I want my kids to enjoy their time here at the middle school. You know, I, I want us to play well and, and all, all through that comes positive experiences. And whether it's friendships or those positive experiences are music, like playing a great concert, playing a great piece, um, going to a great camp. Um, yeah, it's all, it, it all comes back to the, to those positive experiences for sure. Yeah. I've often said that I don't teach music. I teach students through music. Like that's yeah, you know, just something that we, we do. And, and those relationships are so important to me and I know to the students too. Yep. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I'd also say one more thing is that, um, I think as a younger teacher, when I was just starting out, it was about teaching band, you know, and now that I've been, you know, teaching, I think I just finished my 24th year. Um, it is, it's about teaching the students, but, but music is our vehicle. And, you know, I don't, I don't just teach band anymore. I teach a lot of other things. <laughs> so I'm, this is i I'm just kind of curious, what is something that you wish you would have known when you started teaching? Like what, is there any, thing specific yeah a huge thing and, and it's it's still an issue now um you know just from having student teachers and, and talking to other directors um but you know graduates from from college programs now and young teachers generally don't have the knowledge of younger band repertoire um you know we being music majors, we all play at a high level. We're used to playing grade five, grade six literature. And, you know, chances are, if you were in a music major, you probably came from a strong music program as well. So you were playing, you know, great literature there, but um, it's the younger stuff. And, you know, you're probably gonna get your first job teaching elementary or middle school. Not always, but there's a good chance you will. And being able to, to know what is good music at grade one, grade two, grade three levels is so important. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's as focused on the collegiate level as probably it needs to be. And I know there are, I'm sure there's professors that, that do focus in on it, but, but by and large, um, you know, I, I've had student teachers and given them projects, you know, program for a, a middle school concert, give me some good pieces. I mean, I really think um, young teachers should be able to rattle off good composers at, all grade levels, and then give examples of good pieces. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just something that, you know, there's so much to cram in during that collegiate time, I know, but, um, you know, middle school kids deserve uh, good repertoire and good teachers too, not just yeah. high schools. So I feel like uh, in the last maybe five to 10 years, there has been a lot more coming out in that, that grade one to three. I, I feel like there's been a lot of commissioning. Yeah. You know, I'm seeing that. Yes, yes. Yeah, for sure. And I and I have some um, some directors that are that are good friends that have really made it a priority to commission pieces, you know, once or every every two years, um, just for that particular grade level. So uh, I know that when I looked up your um, your professional development courses, 
They were titled Digital Assessment Tools and Technology Integration. Is it always those two classes? Do you have a lot, like, do you have different titles for things? Uh, the, the Digital Assessment Tools has probably been around the longest. Um, and that one is, is really about, you know, finding good tools to use to assess your, your music students. Um, and we also do a book study uh, with a book called Learning First, Technology Second. And it's really helping teachers understand that it's really not about the technology tool. Like there isn't a magic tool that you'll give to your kids and all of a sudden they'll know, you know, their note names or they'll understand, um, you know, key signatures. But it's finding um, a technology tool and then using it with other instructional means then to uh, to boost your students' achievement. Um, and we, the book talks about um, a framework where there's an engagement piece, um, an enhancement piece, and, a, and then an extension piece. So it's about using technology uh, smart, uh, smartly, is that word, I guess? <laughs> uh, and, and, and using it not all the time, not sporadically, but you know, using it specifically um, to help with a specific goal or objective with your students. Like, for example, if you want your students to, um, you know, maybe learn about key signatures, like really know their key signatures. Well, it's not always just drill and kill where, you know, you're doing flashcards on key signatures. Well, um, thinking outside of the box and then having them actually write key signatures, like using flats. I don't know if you're familiar with that um, composing tool. There's a Google add-on um, in, in Docs and Slides, and if you go to the, to the add-ons menu, you can install it. It's called Flat, and that allows um, you and the students to just compose little snippets. So you can ask your students, all right, show me, write a key signature with three flats in it. Now, they could do it on, on paper, right, that, and that's fine too. But so many people are using, so many schools are using Google Classroom now that you could just have your students um, do these examples and, and demonstrate their understanding of key signatures by creating something and then turning that in through Google Classroom. It's just, a, it's a more technological way to do it. I mean, paper works great too. And if that's what you're comfortable with, that's fine. But um, that's leveraging technology and, and allowing them to um, work on it by themselves. Working with a partner is a, is a technology move that um, boosts the effectiveness. So working on it with a partner um, and that book talks about some other strategies that um, you can leverage to help uh, boost your students' achievement. What, what's the sales pitch on the benefits of integrating technology? Because you, you kind of oh, mentioned yeah, it yeah. shouldn't just be like a, a small use. It should be woven into what you're doing. It, yeah, it, it, it's, you know, a lot of times it's more efficient. Um, a lot of times technology will allow students to demonstrate something better than on paper or pencil or better than you know doing something verbally, um, like even something as easy as as Google Forms, like creating um, a quiz for your students to take, or just a you know a quick a formative assessment for them to do it on Google Forms it will save you tons of time rather than grading it by hand. Um, so a lot of times it's um, it's better, like it enhances or it engages the students in a different way. Um, or it's an, an efficient tool, you know, kind of the ultimate use of technology would be um, having your students, um, and this is the extension component, like speak with a composer, like have them create the interview questions. Um, whatever piece you're playing and you want to interview that composer, like have the kids identify spots in the music that they want to ask about you know and getting them to think about the music hey what do you think the composer the composer is doing here what do you think this is supposed to sound like and then they have to internalize that think about it and then you know pose a question to the composer um so really you know that that's kind of the ultimate is that connection piece with um with an expert yeah so if there's such a thing can you think of like walking me through what a typical like class looks like if I walk into your, you know, one of your eighth grade groups, maybe? Yeah. What do I see from the beginning and through the class? And um, so I we have a, um, you know, like most guys, we have an LCD projector and we've had one for we were we, we got our technology or our school has been really into technology. So we had it very early on when they were available and 
it was so nice to not have to write everything on the board, but now I just use like slides or PowerPoint to put the agenda on there and what we're doing, um, reminders and such. And then being able to save all that. So I have a record of all my, basically my lesson plans for the whole entire year. So, and, and I just have that up on the screen. So when the kids come in to class, I mean, they're trained, they just look at the screen and know, and there's no, hey, what are we doing today? Well, I still get kids that ask that. Do we need our instruments today? What? <laughs> <laughs> are we gonna play today? That that doesn't go away. It helps, but but it doesn't go away. Um, so you would always see that. Um, and you know, I don't always use. Beyond that, I don't always. I'm not always using technology. Like, you're not gonna come in and see my kids on their phones doing things all the time, or their or their Chromebooks. Um, you will see me um, off the podium a lot. I walk around the room. I teach. You know, from all parts of the room. Um, because I don't need to be on the podium. Um, you know, in fact, you can hear more and you can see more when you're when you're not on the podium. Um, I do love my Bluetooth receiver, um, love running the metronome from my phone. Um, and that that's just huge. I've been using that for for a long time. Um, but you know, if you've come on the right day, you'll see us using sight reading factory which I, I love. It's a great way to reinforce um, scales and keys. It's also great for uh, introducing and reinforcing rhythm concepts. Um, I really, you know, we probably use that about two or three times a week as part of our part of our warm up. And, um, you know, you'll see uh, if you come on on the right day too, you'll see us doing a Kahoot or a quizzes quizzes. I quizzes is like Kahoot. Um, however, I use quizzes for um, more academic things, like if we're going to be like reviewing in harmonic notes or uh, key signatures or music symbols. I like using it for that because it's I think quizzes is more geared to that. But for fun stuff, if we're doing like a fun Friday and we'll do like music trivia or movie music trivia, um, I like using that uh, using Kahoot for that. Can, can I assume you're like one to one in your school with with devices? Yes, yeah, all our students have Chromebooks. So I'm going to go back up to the the technology integration stuff that you teach, because we know a lot of our I don't know if a lot, but I think probably a lot of our colleagues don't have that. So when they take these um, these classes from you, will they benefit even if they're not one to one? Uh, yes, there, there's definitely some tools. You know, I've, the kids would need to have their own device. Um, but a lot of them, you can share a device. Um, kids can use their phones with them. Um, or a lot of schools have, they don't have their Chromebooks, but they have an iPad cart. Right. Um, and some things you don't actually need the kids to have a device. Like it might be a, a tech tool for the teacher that allows them to teach better. Um, so I, I really try to hit on all fronts and, uh, you know, all disciplines, not, you know, not just band, it's for all. It's for band, orchestra, choir, genre music. Awesome. So I know you mentioned Bluetooth receiver, and I think that would be my answer to this question for me. What piece of technology would be most difficult for you to give up? I, you know, I, I, I have to say my phone. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, gosh, I, I use it, you know, not only, you know, in class, but just productivity, um, you know, personally, I, I just think it's an essential piece of, of technology and you know what i tell you there's a there's an app and i think it's just called i'm looking right now i think it's just called music scanner but um i don't remember where i learned about this app but it was some uh oh sheet music scanner at some point last year um and it allows you to to basically to use your phone scan a piece of music and then it will automatically turn that into an xml file Oh, and wow. and you can export that to note flight finale sibelius whatever and it, it will even play the music on your phone from taking a, a picture of it it'll play it you can change the instruments it's it's really amazing it, i think it costs like seven or eight bucks totally worth it because when i was having to rewrite things and create solos or duets like it really became an essential tool it saved me a ton of time so i taught uh, middle school for about seven years before i i moved into high school and then a couple years ago i started doing beginning band again and um it's really kind of made me reconsider going back to middle school teaching uh so i'm curious for you was what is it about the middle school experience that you love 
it's just fun. Uh, I, I really like the kids. I think I have a middle school personality. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm 48 years old, but you know, I still have the humor of a 12 year old boy. I think, um, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I really like the age. I, I think the kids are fun. They're interesting. Um, not that I wouldn't ever love to teach high school because I think there's great things about that, but uh, you know, my first job was teaching middle school and elementary and you know, I never thought I, that's what I would be teaching, but it's, I really like it. I'm, I'm comfortable here. I've found that those, those seventh and eighth grade years in particular, there's an energy level that really needs to be like harnessed and like, and directed. And when you're able to do that, like, it's amazing what you can get them to do. Yeah. Um, and that would maybe be my weakness as a teacher. If I was to pick on something is seventh, and eighth grade, harnessing that energy. Um, what, what advice would you give me if that's the trend, if I wanted to make that transition back into middle school? So when you say harnessing the energy, are you mean like, like they're, they just have this energy and, and you just want to use it in a positive way? Yeah. Like, <laughs> or... you know, when, they, when they walk in the room and the room is just buzzing. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And well, it, you know what? Like it's, it's giving them an opportunity to, um, you know, to be social, I think, cause a lot of that energy I think is social. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they, their, their friendship is, is huge in seventh and eighth grade. I mean, well, and all in middle school, I think, but as you get closer to seventh and eighth graders, it's even a, a bigger thing. Friendships, you know, just their importance. So giving them an opportunity to, you know, to talk a little bit before class or at the end of class or both, or even, you know, a couple minutes in the middle of rehearsal while you're changing pieces or something, give them time to socialize. Um, because, you know, it, it's not about getting down to business right away and never laughing or smiling or or being social during rehearsal because we're serious and we want to play really well and we want to get first place or we want to get a first rating. Um, but just allowing the kids to be themselves and to to be relaxed because it, you're going to be able to teach better. They're going to be better learners. Um, and I, you know, I think that comes with maturity as a teacher too. I think as a young teacher, it was all about business mm -hmm. and I mean, it still is about business, but I just know how to do it better now. Yeah. I know. I know one thing that like I use, <clears throat> excuse me, that I use in the high school that, that it is even successful in middle school is simply like changing seating charts and doing different seating. Yes. Uh, sometimes letting them sit next to their best friend, because I know for me, I, one of my best friends played trombone. So that was yep. one of the reasons I loved it so much is because I got to sit next to him. Yep. Um, yeah. And I love um, rotating the first row yeah. out. Like, actually, I had the, like, this, this is a great book on teaching band by Eddie Green. Um, he cites a bunch of things. And that's one of the things that he used as a teacher is just coming up with a schedule and rotating the first row every day of the week. Um, oh, now, I'm not, I'm not that structured and do it, but I do it often. And, you know, the flutes love it when they get to go to the fourth row and you bring the low brass up to the first row. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many times we, we don't do things like that because we didn't have those experiences. Yeah. And, right. And, uh, and so we got to think outside the box and, and hopefully have encounters with educators like you that are, that are doing that stuff. So yeah. um, team teaching now, this is something that um, I'd like to try to institute more of. Um, because I, I see how, it, how it's beneficial. Um, but what if I'm going, going to say, hey, this year we're going to team teach this, what kind of obstacles could I anticipate? What, what makes team teaching difficult? Um, well, there's a couple things. Um, first of all, you have to have a schedule that allows for it. Um, really, your administrators need to be on the same page and design a schedule so that the music teachers are freed up to be available during one period to two people. Um, so if that if that's the case, you're already you, you can make it happen because if you don't have a schedule that's going to allow for that, there's no way you can make, you know, team teaching work um, and everybody needs to buy into it. Um, and you have to be comfortable teaching, you know, outside of your normal discipline. So like I'm a trombone player, um, but uh, I also help teach eighth grade orchestra. And I've also helped taught um, seventh and eighth grade choir. So I, you know, we have to remember that we're music educators and that that might not be our strength, but you know, 
you might have to tighten your belt a little bit and and go back to college and remember how to do some of those things. And uh, it works better because it allows for more flexibility. Um, you know, if there's one person teaching, you know, an orchestra, four different instruments in band, what, eight, nine in different instruments, um, there are so many possibilities and benefits than to having a second teacher because then you can do sectionals, you can do lessons, you can uh, pull out kids that you need to reteach uh, a concept on, you can pull out kids that um, know their music and you need to challenge them a bit by maybe doing some chamber music with them. Um, there's all kinds of different things that you can do with team teaching and um, you know we're fortunate enough in, in Batavia here that we've been doing it since um, well, since I got here in 2001. So it's, you know, it's great. It's been such a positive experience. All right. So switching gears here. Um, I, I like to, I like to talk to people about how they spend their summers because we're all very different. Um, for me, June is marching band time. So that's, it's, we're not, I mean, it's not every day, you know, eight hours a day, but it's quite a bit of time. July is my time and I mostly switch off. I mean, barring having a YouTube channel and podcast. Um, and August is the time for me to really start. Like that's when I start going back to school, dedicating some time to prep. So how about you? Do you take time away from schoolwork during the summer? Uh, yes. Um, although I'm, I don't think I'm as structured as you are. Um, you know, I, and we kind of talked about it before we started recording here, but, you know, I do much better when, when I have structure. So I, I really love the school schedule because I know exactly when I'm teaching, when I'm not teaching, what I need to do. So the summers for me are a little problematic <laughs> because I don't have that structure. I have to design my own structure. Um, but I do, you know, I'm definitely not as busy, um, you know, going into school and teaching. So I'm definitely at home a lot more. Um, but I really try in the mornings, you know, before kids wake up or there's kids activities, because I, I have three kids. Um, I really try to knock out the things that I need to do, or at least make a plan on what I need to do. So I can be strategic about about it. And I really try to, you know, like for my Vandercook stuff i try to knock that stuff out in the morning um you know just wake up get a cup of coffee and sit on the porch with my laptop and just either grade or i'm doing a you know creating assignments um and then the rest of the day i will fit in i'll, I'll try to work on some things um in, like if kids are at activities or, or something i'll try to fit it in um but it's i'm, I'm a really busy dad right now so it it's just hard, but the morning time is when I really try to, to knock that stuff out. You, do you like to program for the whole year? Do you, do you knock it that far out? Uh, I, yes and no. Um, I start planning for the next year in about April, May, yeah. and I'll just pull up a Google doc and start, um, you know, putting down pieces that I, I think I want to program. Um, like I already, I'm already thinking about, okay, this band next year as eighth graders, we're going to have to work on, you know, we're going to have to work on, you know, high notes for the clarinets because they're really, you know, it's so flat or they're squeaky or, you know, I don't have a strong, um, you know, brass section for next year. So I'll be, th so I'm thinking about pieces that are going to work well or that I think might work well. So I'll start writing down those pieces and then I'll write down concepts that I think we need to, to really work on um, a little bit more than usual. And I'll start doing that and I'll just keep adding to it all throughout the summer. And then, you know, when end of July, beginning August hits, then I'm really like actually getting that music out and looking at it and being like, okay, our first concerts, you know, program in the fall for your, for your weaknesses, right? And program for your strengths in the spring is, you know, I kind of guides me a bit. Yeah, that's I'm 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 very similar. I actually start a little more low tech. I start a notebook that I always have with me. Yeah, in spring and and then I eventually yeah. transfer it over to my my Google spreadsheet. Yeah. You know, and I do also. I don't know if you've heard of this philosophy called the eighty twenty philosophy. Um, it is um, choosing your music. Like, let's say you're going to play, you know, three or four pieces for a concert. Well, choosing one challenging piece where um that's going to be like your 20 percent piece you know that's going to but in, in, and the rest of the music you choose the 80 percent is going to be a lot more accessible to your students 
and that you're just focusing on that one challenging piece, that 20% then for, you know, assessments and for really stretching your kids. Because as a young teacher, you know, I, I remember just, you know, programming everything that was challenging. Well, we'll get better just by playing challenging music. And you get a lot of frustration from the kids. You feel a lot of frustration because the kids aren't progressing. And it was like this, you know, here, I just pulled some books as I thought I'd reference it, but this pathways book is that what had by Joseph Alsobrook that he talks about the 80, 20 philosophy. And it was like, that gave me permission to, to do that. Like, oh my gosh, that makes total sense. I'm just going to program one really challenging piece. And then the others are going to be more accessible. And you know what? We have more fun in rehearsals. We have more fun. The, the concerts are, I would say, you know, more successful at a higher level. Um, it, it just has really opened my eyes and, and allowed for, I think, better programming. Yeah, that's if I go back and ask myself that question about going back in time and telling a young Scott one piece of advice, <laughs> I think I would just grab myself and be like, program easier music. It's going to benefit you and the students. <laughs> just do Yeah, that. right. Because they'll still learn things, yep. you know, but you don't need to be killing the kids on every piece. No, and they'll they'll also learn deeper, right? They'll like you'll get into like crescendos more. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, your ballad will actually have musicality to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy, that'd be great. So, all right. So we we talked a little bit about this, um, you know, balancing in a way we talked about this, the personal professional thing, because I like to talk about it because I think educators can be particularly bad at it, especially during the school year. You clearly have a lot of things going on. In addition to your, your work at Rotolo, you've got the Vandercook stuff, your conductor at the Illinois Summer Music uh, uh youth music at the University of Illinois uh, Champaign-Urbana, your co-founder and coordinator for the middle school concert band camp at Music for All uh, Symposium. You've presented sessions at Midwest, Virginia Music Education, a bunch of, bunch of pre presentations. So with all, th all things going on, do you have any like advice? Because you, in addition to all that, you're a husband, you're a dad, you're a runner, you're a fisherman. Um, what, whatever other labels you have, how do you balance all that? Uh, it's not easy. Um, and you just have to remember that your job isn't your priority. Um, and that, you know, I have to take my own advice a lot because it's easy to get those two confused. It's easy to get, you know, caught up in, in teaching music and, you know, because that occupies being a, being a music educator occupies a huge amount of our time. We, I mean, we're not, we're just working at school. We're working you know, outside of school. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I like to say that I'm, you know, 48 year old Keith is a better version of, of that than I was at 38 years old. Um, and I really think family has kind of forced that hand a bit. And, you know, my wife giving me reminders too, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, and, but I, finding a hobby too, like finding something to do to decompress, is huge because um you know whether it's running or you know working out but just being able to do something else and kind of letting letting your mind wander a bit is just does wonders like i i think i've had some of the best thoughts running you know about whether it's teaching or it's you know personally um it, it's it's almost like therapy a bit um, so I, you know, I would, it's, it's hard, but it really to think about your job is second and your family is, is their priority. And, yeah. you know, that's a good reason to relax too. Like it forces you to, to find some time to relax. All right. Now on to something that's really important. Your proclaimed coffee addict. Um, <laughs> what's your, what's your preferred method for making coffee? <laughs> uh i do the uh, we have a drip coffee maker yep. at home um i did get uh, a christmas present for my wife last christmas i got an espresso oh, which I, I want one okay holy cow like fantastic a yep. little pricey like you know it's 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 like a dollar oh five a pod yeah um so it's not like a, a K cup. We are going to be doing two or three a day. Um, but, uh, those are, those are fantastic. I've had some great coffee 
And I tell you, I, I, if I use an espresso, I actually drink less coffee during the day. Um, cause it kind of just sets you up and you're good to go cause it's super strong. <laughs> um, but, but I love, you know, my drip coffee maker and, you know, every morning that thing is running and, you know, I haven't used an espresso at all over the summer. So maybe when the school school starts again. Um, all right. So, uh, we've, we've talked about a lot of stuff, but I know we've left a lot of things hanging. So I'd like you to briefly plug anything that you got coming up, um, your website, whatever else you might want to plug right now. Uh, well, my website, teaching music and more.com it's just like a dumping ground for, you know, blog posts that I've done, uh, videos I've created. If I'm teaching, doing some professional development, I'll put those links up there too. Um, you know, I started a blog, a technology blog like years ago, um, and I had to move it to, uh, to a new site. So that's when I kind of created this one and just made it a general, uh, music type thing with, uh, you know, mostly band stuff, but I think any music educator can get, um, some useful tools and information off of it. Um, I, we have actually a new Vandercook class coming up that is reaching out to teachers, um, about just kind of rebuilding, refresh, re-energizing for the school year. And we've got some great people involved. In fact, we're going to have a keynote speaker. Mickey Smith Jr. is going to do oh, yeah. the keynote. He's going to kick everything off. Um, and then uh, we've got some great teachers, some Vandercook teachers, some not. Um, Bobby Lambert, who does some great leadership stuff um, with, with high school students around the country. Tiffany Hitz, fantastic middle school director in Virginia. Darcy Williams from Texas. She does the After the Sectionals podcast and then also oh, yeah. has, a, um, has a book out. She's doing um, a session. Jarrell Horton, Lisa Hatfield, Jonathan Glowey. Um, He's a Michigan orchestra director. So it's, it's about um, the, the title is called Rebuilds, uh, Recruit, Cultivate and Motivate, Gearing Up for the New Year and Getting Your Students Back in the Game. And it's just about, um, you know, we're going to hit on recruitment and retention, rebuilding the culture in the music room. Um, how do we rebuild skills and musicianship? Everything that was lost, you know, the past 18 months, um, we're going to give teachers some uh, some tools and some inspiration from these wonderful people that are going to be doing sessions. That's August, the week of August 6th. Is that what you had said? So the, it kicks off August 3rd with the keynote and then it's Thursday nights for the next four weeks. So August 5th, August 12th, August 19th, August 26th, you'll be able, um, people will be able to take, if they need a credit, one college credit for it, they can do that. Um, and you also be able to, um, take it without college credit. If you just want to, to, to listen in and, and be in on the sessions, you can do that as well. All right. What else? Anything else you want to tell us about? Um, just about five years ago, uh, my good friend, Greg Scapolato and I started a middle school concert band camp at music for all music for all is just a wonderful, um, organization. They do concert band, jazz stuff, marching band events in the fall. And they have just a wonderful summer camp that's been around for a long time. I went there as a high school student. Um, fantastic teachers involved with it. And for many years, it's only been open to high school kids. And we started a middle school concert band camp there about five years ago. And it's at Ball State University. It's um, usually the third week of June. And it's fantastic camp, great teachers. Kids are well taken care of. They have counselors assigned to them um, that travel with them throughout the day. They get to stay in dorm rooms with, uh, with the roommates. The food at Ball State is wonderful, um, and they also get to do, part. yeah, they, they also get to do um, team building sessions, too, with Fran Kick, who's an amazing person, um, and uh, there's amazing evening concerts, too, at, a, at Music for All Camp, just wonderful artists that uh, do evening concerts, so fantastic camp. I can't, uh, you know, suggest this camp enough. We haven't had it the past two years, right? Um, so we're looking forward to having it in 2022. Oh, that's great. All right. Well, Keith, this has been a great conversation. I've been looking forward to this literally for a couple of months now. So, um, I think yeah, glad we're able to connect. Yes. Thank you so much for your time. And, um, I, I hope we get to connect either via zoom. Maybe I'll be down in the Batavia area sometime. I'd love to stop in and say hi. Yeah, definitely. All right. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, Scott.